בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, and בעזרת השם we'll learn a few new things. So first I actually wanted to tell you guys about the book. Give me one of the books for a second, sure. that first one. So this book, this book, this book. <laughs> this book, actually, seriously, it's, it's a, it's a uh, by Rabbi Baruch Chai. And uh, it's actually one of the best books about Shabbat that, you know, for me, that to, to learn some of the things that we do, we were just talking before, you know, a lot of the things that, you know, there's 39 melachot that you're not allowed to do, 39 things that you're not allowed to do. And so this book shows you, even though it looks like it's for kids, it's really for adults, where it shows you not only what you're not allowed to do, but why. And that's really, I think that's one of the biggest problems with Judaism today is that a lot of people do things where they're doing it because somebody told them, so okay, so I know I don't have to, I can't drive, but... Why? And we tell somebody, oh no, because you're not light fire. Like, well, I don't see a fire inside my car. But then once you learn about a little bit about the electric current that goes on in the engine of a car, you realize, okay, this is nothing less than fire, if, if not more than fire. So the key is to know why we're doing what we're doing, not just do it like robots, because again, even though Hashem says, you know, listen, you have to do everything that I say without even necessarily knowing the real root reason, if we have the ability to know the basics, which is in, in uh, and, and the basic reasons of why we're doing it, and more and more importantly, the tam, which is like the uh, uh, not necessarily the benefit, but I guess the, the, the object behind why we're doing each mitzvah, it gives us more of a reason of why to do it. Now, when it comes down to um, to all the mitzvot, each one of them has a reason of why we're doing them. The real reason of all mitzvot. The real reason of all things that we're allowed to do and all, th- or that we have to do, and all things that we're not allowed to do, is one reason for all of them. Why? Hashem said so. That's the real reason. That's it. There's no other reason that's really necessary. But because our generation is so low, we constantly try to tie things to humanity. We constantly try to tie things to what we're used to. We're constantly trying to understand what we're doing, and I think what ends up happening with a lot of people is that since sometimes they're so far from religion, and they're so far from Hashem, that it just doesn't make sense to them, so don't even bother trying to figure it out. Or worse, they go to the wrong sources. So when, for example, we tell somebody, listen, keep Shabbat, this is one of the core parts of Judaism, you know, it's, uh, you have, uh, you know, Judaism has, and the Torah has, Three covenants with Hashem. Three things that in the Torah specifically, Hashem is calling a covenant, a brit. Okay, so you have Shabbat. The, the, uh, the word Shabbat has uh, three letters. You have Shin, Bet, Taf. Shin stands for Shabbat. Uh, Bet uh, stands for brit, like brit milah. And uh, Taf is Tfilin, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So these three things are the core of Judaism. That's the core of Judaism. You want, if, if anyone asks you what makes you Jewish, is if you do these three things. If somebody doesn't do these three things, they really can't consider them Jewish. Just because your mother is Jewish doesn't necessarily make you Jewish. Yes, you're Jewish naturally. You have the privilege of being able to uh, benefit from these mitzvot, and you also have the downside if you don't keep these mitzvot. But in reality, when it comes down to it, what makes someone Jewish is following what Hashem said. Hashem gave us the definition of what Jewish is, and, and most importantly, he gave us these three covenants. What is a covenant? A covenant is a deal, an agreement between two people. Now, in this case, it's not an agreement between two people. It's an agreement between us and the creator of the universe. So my cousin always tells me anytime that you have a business question or anytime you have a business issue that you're thinking about or anytime you're thinking about giving tzedakah or anytime there's any money issue, anytime that you're thinking about anything, you have a difficulty in life, Make a deal with Hashem. Not necessarily a deal like some people make. Well, listen, Hashem, if you're making me rich, I'll do tshuva. But give what you're doing some type of significance spiritually. So you're saying, for example, I am, you know, for, for the benefit of my success, you know, for, for, so, so maybe to give myself a, or give Hashem a reason to help me in this case, I'm going to start doing tefillin every day, and Bezat Hashem, life will become a little clearer. My road in life, my difficult road in life, will become a little clearer, and at least I'll understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. So it's not that Hashem, Hashem, give me this, and then I'll give you back. You have to start doing first. 
So that's why they also say that anytime you go into travel uh, somewhere, like uh, either something that's out of state, uh, no, not just tefillat adir, but something that's good to do is to give tzedakah before you go, put a dollar in a tzedakah box or anything that you can afford, and also say that when I come back, I'm going to give another the other dollar or another amount of money, then when I come back, I want to put it back. So because they say that I, someone that's on a way of doing a mitzvah is unlikely, not definite, but unlikely to get hurt. So for example, if you're going to uh, travel, like recently when I went to travel, went to uh, New York, you know, we put something in the tzedakah box, and we already put the money aside, that when we come back, we're going to put it in the tzedakah box. So again, these are little... So the stock, the, stock, sorry, the stock box could be or in the home or in the synagogue, doesn't it? Yeah, it doesn't anywhere, necessarily, right? it could be anywhere. It could be in a, in a synagogue, it could be in Here, your home, and, it could be at right. a local store, it's not... Uh, but you're committing, in essence, to, to, to do something and, and make Hashem partners with what you're doing. And that's, I think that's really important. And that's the thing, when Before we're working... Travel and after travel. And that's for traveling. For work also. Why is Hashem going to let you succeed? So already you have to put into your mind, okay, I'm going to, you know, with, with the work that I'm doing, part of what I'm doing is not only to provide for myself and my family, which of course we all need to do, but part of what I'm going to do is to help other people. And that's actually one of the things I saw, I saw earlier today, actually. There was a scientific video where they were saying, can money make somebody happy? And one of the things that they scientifically proved is that people that buy things for themselves with their money are less likely to be happy than people that use their money to buy things for other people. And this is, this is obviously coming from the Torah also, as the Torah talks about it a lot more. So in essence, when you're helping other people, it's not only going to fulfill your own needs as far as being happy in life, but more so, it's going to give you a huge benefit for the next world. So when it comes down to your business or any types of dealings that you're doing, the more you involve Hashem in what you're doing, the more likely you are going to have a clearer direction, more help from Hashem, Amen. And, and something that I think would make your job and your business much more significant. To just go to work, do what you need to do, go home, pay the bills, stay with the family, go back again. It becomes mundane after a while. It becomes the same thing over and over again. You know. And again, even though there are different sections, times in our life where we enjoy our job more than others, that stuff doesn't necessarily always last if it's just purely the same basic thing over and over again. Okay, so let's say I enjoy my job today, I do it for 15 years, I can't guarantee myself that in another 15 years I'm going to be the same thing. You know, so... When you're involving other things, when you're involving things that are beyond our day-to-day -day job, when you're involving Hashem in your day-to-day -day work, it makes things much more significant. When you're involving helping other people and you see what's the point of doing all of this stuff, it gives what you're doing a purpose. So now going back to this uh, uh, Shabbat book, so it gives us all the things that we're not allowed to do, but, but it gives us the reason. So for example here, you have a... Uh, there was this, uh, okay, so let's see, for example, over here, Zoe. Zoe is winnowing. So that's like separating, uh, separating things, separating the, the good things from like, like a, uh, from, from the bad. So if something is, if you're peeling something, okay, so you have two parts. You have what you want, like a fruit, let's say, and then you have a, the peel that you don't need. Okay, now, if you're doing it just with a single fruit, it's, it's, it's different, but let's say if in, in this particular example, they're showing you somebody that's going through the, uh, uh, through the uh, straw, that he's taking some of the uh, straw and throwing it in the air to, to a separate, put it in a separate file, uh, pile. Now, this is normal day-to-day -day work that these people were doing. On Shabbat, you're not allowed to do it. Okay, so the last time I checked, none of you guys are farmers, none of you guys deal with straw, so how does this relate to you? So one of the things that I learned some time ago is that what a lot of people do is, uh, um, what are these things called? Uh, uh, fistukim. I call fistukim. Pistachios. 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 No. Okay, pistachios. You have, to, you have to peel them. Okay, so pistachios, you could eat pistachios on Shabbat, but there's an issue here. Right, so here's the thing. So you have some, what a lot of people do because they want to have a neat house and something, you know, and they don't want to have these pistachios all over the floor or something. So what do they do? They give you a bowl of pistachios and they give you an empty bowl. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're eating the pistachio, you're putting it into the empty bowl. You're eating the pistachio, you put the peel into the empty Same bowl. Same thing as sunflower seeds. Right, you're not allowed to do that. 
Oh, you know. Sunflower, sunflower seeds either? Not allowed to do with anything. Sunflower seeds, you're allowed to eat them. You're allowed to eat them, but it can't be, but it can't be right. But it can't be in ready. two separate bowls. And that's really what winnowing is. That's what zore is. You cannot take the peels of the feast of the make like that. Right, exactly. Because you're separating the waste, the unwanted object, from what you yeah. want. In essence, you're doing exactly what he's doing. Okay. And that's the thing. So you can't so do that. So if you eat it, but with no two different bowls, so you just then try the way Right, like, exactly. That so that's, that's the way to do it. It goes for other things too. You're not allowed to, in Shabbat, you're not allowed to take the good, only the good, out of something. That's exactly what, I'm, what we're saying here. Because you're Because you're, sure. you're taking so the waste, the... you're taking the waste and you're putting it somewhere so else, you're you separating it. If you're eating it and you're just putting it right there on the table, it's the same concept, huh? Anyway. Not necessarily, because that, you're putting it in the same area as something else. It's not pure waste. You, so that's why what people and do is usually they put something good there. So they take one feast stuk that's not peeled. That's not that you haven't eaten. And, oh, okay. and they put it there. So in essence, there's good on both sides. So, so that's, that's a little tricks to the trade. But again, if we don't know these little things, yeah, you're breaking Shabbat. then you're breaking Shabbat without realizing it. And Shabbat, is, it's not like it's a, in the beginning, especially when you first are into Shabbat, it's not easy. You know, it's fun. It's great. It's the best day of the week. But that doesn't necessarily come right away. So, you could be working really hard to, to keep Shabbat because especially in the beginning it's tough for you because your friends are not around because they don't want to keep Shabbat or your girlfriend's not around or the wife doesn't want to keep Shabbat or the kids don't want to keep Shabbat and the neighborhood that doesn't want to keep Shabbat. You're the only one that's really trying really hard. So you're saying, okay, so I'm going to do everything I can to keep Shabbat. And the next thing you know, so you're doing something very simple and you're breaking Shabbat and you don't even realize it. Now, even though... To make a sin that you don't know is a sin does not get the same punishment. If you didn't know it. If you didn't know it, it still gets a punishment. So don't let anyone fool you. That just because you didn't know, it's okay. That's completely, a, that's completely wrong. There's still a punishment for it. It's still bad. Now, it's not the same punishment as we talked that it's in the verse in, in uh, Exodus book, the, uh, the chapter we talked about where the person gets cut off from the nation and so on. It's called shogeg. Shogeg meaning you made a sin in shogeg, which is an unintentional sin. So when someone makes an unintentional sin, it's not the highest level punishment, but it's still in essence something wrong. So it's just like, for example, if, uh, if somebody, uh, uh, let's say, went through, a, went through a light, you know, he drove through a uh, red light. Like I did today with the truck, I couldn't stop. <laughs> so he drove, dro drives through a light, and the cop's right there, and, okay, so that guy looks at the cop, smiles at him, and keeps driving faster. When the cop finally catches him, he's going to get a serious punishment, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the other guy just crossed the light, but, you know, he, uh, he didn't mean to. So he stopped right away and then reversed. The cop still saw it, and he still stopped him. Because, listen, you still went through the light, even though you didn't go through it. You still went through the light. Now, he may still give him a ticket. Maybe you let him go. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that his punishment is still not going to be anywhere near the punishment of the guy that smiled at the cop and waved as if he's one of his friends. And that's really what it comes down to. So, yes, it's okay not to know, but not permanently. And that's the thing. So these little things that we do every day, we don't realize that, they're not, that we're not allowed to do them. So this is a phenomenal book to learn some of these things because it's a very simple way. So number one, it's a great way... If you have kids to teach them, because people, kids see drawings, it attracts them. For me personally, I see drawings, I get attracted to it. So maybe I'm a little kid at heart still. I feel 700, but sometimes I like drawings, I like cartoons. Uh, but the other thing is, is that so it's a good way to, to teach your kids, but even more so, it's a phenomenal way to teach yourself. Because if you're going to do something you want to know why. So for example, with, with something like this, you look at a picture, you're like, wait a minute, winnowing? Who does winnowing? I don't have a farm. I live in Florida. What, what, winnowing? How, what's, how is this even relevant to me? You look at a few pictures and you see, oh, look at this guy. This guy you know, has a bunch of nutshells, and he's blowing away uh, these, the, the peel of the nutshells off of the plate, and obviously it's not allowed. So, again, the, uh, the things that we do every day that we think is not a big deal really is a big deal. So if you're already doing what Hashem wants, it only takes a matter of a few, you know, minutes to figure out what you can and can't do. 
So this is a very, very highly recommended. The, uh, the guy that um, is the artist of this book and also a series of a few other books I have over there for, uh, for you guys to look at uh, is uh, Bal Chuva that really changed his life in a, in, a, in a great way where he used to, he's an artist obviously, but he used to do things that were completely not what uh, Hashem wants and he's turning his entire livelihood into something that's, you know, all of what Hashem wants and Baruch Hashem has had huge success with it. So it also shows us that when Hashem says that the root of all of our blessings is from Shabbat. Someone wants to have blessings in his life, in marriage, raising children, work, anything, anything that you want a blessing in, to even get to the point of having Hashem pay attention to you, you have to keep Shabbat. So if someone is having problems with, with any one of those things we just talked about, or many other things, health, things like that, and they're not keeping Shabbat, then you've got to think about this. You've got to think about this logically. Shabbat is the covenant. It's the deal between us and Hashem. Tefillin is the covenant between us and Hashem. Brit is the covenant between us and Hashem. These are three basic roots of Judaism. There's many other things, but again, this is the basics. So now Hashem says, listen, keep these three things, you're Jewish. Keep more, obviously, more. But the point is, you don't. Really, we have nothing, we have nothing to talk about. So now, He gave us our bodies, our eyes, our legs, our hands, our families, our, our wives, our children, our work, our minds, and everything that he's giving us every single day that we're alive is a miracle. And then he's asking us to do something very, very basic. And we don't do it. And then something happens. He's trying to wake us up. So something bad happens. Because we don't wake up from something good. No, you know, no one that I know of or ever heard of in history of mankind became more religious because they won the lotto. It's usually the opposite. They lost the lotto winnings and then they became religious. So Hashem wakes us up with something bad. And he says, ah, Hashem, listen, I just got fired from my job. This is really bad. I don't know how I'm going to make Parnassah. I don't know how I'm going to survive this month. I don't know what I'm going to do. So he shows up at the door. He's like, Hashem, please help me. But there's no answer. Why is there no answer? What did you do for me? How about this? What did you do for yourself? I told you to keep a few things. Shabbat. Basics. Shabbat. A few basic things and you didn't keep it. Now you want my help? Why? why? Why should he help you? And that's the thing that you have to think about logically. If you have a friend that the only times he ever calls you is when he needs something. But the one time you ask them, hey, listen, do you have some sugar to give me? You know, you have, you have just sugar. I don't want anything big. I just want sugar. It's a big story. It's a big story. Ah, oh, sugar. You know how expensive sugar is today? I got my sugar from Whole Foods. They charge a dollar more than Super Value does. It gives you a whole story of why he can't give you a little bit of sugar. Mm -hmm. Is this a friend or an enemy? And Sorry. that's the thing. So that's what we have to realize is that even though Hashem is not our friend, it can't, we can't treat it much differently when it comes down to these things. If he's telling us to do something very basic that's actually for our own benefit and then we don't do it and then something bad happens and then we come back to him and he says, please help me. Yes, yeah, Shem is all merciful and he could definitely help us but I don't know. I, 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 on, a, on a logical perspective, I really wouldn't depend, it, depend on it because I never really gave him a reason to, to heal me. I never gave him a reason to fix me. I never gave him a reason to fix any of these things that I want him to help me with. So why would he do it? Of course, he does it to everybody every day. And you ask, the first question that naturally comes to people is like, okay, yeah, but why is this guy that I know that doesn't keep anything, he's a multimillionaire, he has a new Ferrari every year, and he has this and he has that, and uh, it looks like he has the best life in the world. I can guarantee you that it's not that. Yes, maybe he has money, but money doesn't really do much for you as far as giving you purpose in your life. Uh, from personal experience that I have and from being involved with a lot of people with a lot of money, I can tell you that happiness and money have nothing to do with each other. And unfortunately, most of those people, one of the things that I learned from Rabbi Mizrahi, he says it in his lectures uh, several times, is that 
usually people like that, that have what seems like they have everything and don't do anything that Hashem wants, usually those are the people you need to feel bad for. Because that means that Hashem is paying them for any mitzvah that they did in this life. Because after this life, there's not much good to look forward to. So anybody, most people have done some type of mitzvah in their life. Maybe they did tefillin one time when they were 13 years old and they had their bar mitzvah, they did it once in their life. Maybe they gave some tzedakah here and there. Maybe they uh, helped a few people here and there. So they did a few good things. And Hashem promises that He's going to pay us for everything that we do. The problem is that if we're starting to get paid in this world too much, that's not necessarily something we need to celebrate. That usually means that everything we're going to get, we're going to get in this world. And after that, not so much. Not, not a good picture. So when we're doing these things, when we're thinking about Shabbat, when we're thinking about Tefillin, when we're thinking about any of these things that Hashem is asking us to do, first of all, we have to realize that we're doing all of this for ourselves. Second of all, we have to give Hashem a reason to help us. And that's really the bottom line. We're going to need help tomorrow. We're going to need help probably in 10 minutes from now. We're going to need help every day of our life. Of course, the things that we don't realize and take for granted, like breathing, eating, uh, you know, just, just being alive, being able to see, being able to hear, uh, you know, all of these things are miracles of their own. But let's just say the things that we, don't, that we do consider miracles, like the fact that we got a new promotion, the fact that we got more money or a new wife or a new this, or all of these things that we really aspire to have, we're going to need Hashem to help us. And last week we talked about, or two weeks ago, we talked about the blessing of Asher Yatzav, the, the blessing that you say uh, after you go to the bathroom. And I can tell you guys that this is probably one of the things that people take for granted more than anything else in life. Thank you. I keep it in my wallet. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So that's the thing. Say it every time you go to the bathroom. It Because again, it's not just about the fact that you're saying it just to go through the motion. But if you really think about it, the fact that we are able to excrete all of the waste in our body and keep all of the nutrients and have our body work like the best machine ever created is phenomenal. I mean, just think about that for a second. Like, if you wanted, if you had a factory, or you go to any farm, or you go to any, any major company that manufactures things, every company has wastes. Every company has wastes. So, what is one of two options. Either you have people that manually take, or take out this, take this waste, or you have machines that take out the waste. The problem is that in both cases, it's not going to be perfect. In both cases, there's going to be losses. So the company is going to have the machine malfunction or there's going to be a glitch and a lot of good product will be lost and they just that's just part of the equation. So they say, listen, we have a 5% or 6% uh, ratio of lost product due to this machine. We, can't, we can never be perfect. This machine is phenomenal and we paid hundreds of millions of dollars to build it and design it, but it works 95% of the time. It's not so bad. Manual is even worse. Human mistakes, they're endless. It could be 50%, nobody even knows it. So, our body is not like that. If there's something in your body that you don't need, it's out. Whether you want to or not. And if it's not out, you know about it immediately. You have an immediate warning in your body where you immediately start getting warm, and the next thing you know, you have something called a fever. And our fever is actually our body protecting us. And all of these things that the body does, to, to, it's all automatic. You don't need to press anything. You don't need to shake in a certain way. You don't have to call some guy from you know, a hospital to tell you, listen, what to do. And then you do. The body works automatically. So when you're saying, Asher Yatzal, you're thanking Hashem for making everything work so perfectly that you don't even have to think about it. To us, it's just natural. I just, okay, I went to the bathroom, everything worked, I left, I went about my day, and I forgot about the fact that it even happened. But in reality, if something didn't work for even a minute second, 
just a second, you wouldn't be able to function. And I know this from personal experience of health issues for, you know, that started in 2006 for me and even before, but I'm telling you, when it comes down to your health, it's so underappreciated. And people always say, yeah, when you have your health, you have everything. Only someone that has been unhealthy knows that. People that have not had health issues, they could say that it's, it's a nice uh, thing to say. It sounds good. has a good, run, good uh, ring to it. It's all nice. But I'm telling you, you do not know what you have until you don't have it, especially with health. Because it's something extraordinary. And the fact that we're able to have this machine function in such a perfect way that we don't even think about it. It's not even like it's not even a part of our, 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 our thought process every day is a miracle. So another thing that I, uh, I read a while ago, this is probably uh, something like a, uh, a friend of mine sent this to me uh, about a year or two years ago, something like that, uh, that I thought is also something that this is good for us to know, but it's especially good for people that are very scientific and sometimes are atheists or having a tr trouble believing that there's a creator or like the Greeks where they believe, okay, yes, there was a creator, but he left. Everything that we're doing every day is up to us. That's what the uh, Greeks uh, believed. They believe that, yes, there was Aristo or Plato, uh, uh, these uh, philosophers that people in essence almost idolize uh, because they were very smart but still made a huge error that made them very, very foolish. So all of, there's a lot of people that do believe that there's something there, but only when they want to or they need it. So that's what I call personally a convenient God. It's not the real God, it's a convenient God. It's a God that comes whenever they need it, like Santa Claus or something like that. It's not, unfortunately, it's a very, very huge false belief and it's kfirah. It's something that's completely heresy. Um, and there's other people that don't believe at all because they read some book in high school or some, some, some place and they think that everything came from a, uh, from a, a Big Bang and it uh, came from nothing. And uh, it sounds, it's a little strange because I thought, okay, you know what, you, know, you could do a science experiment and, and maybe take the phone and smash it on the floor and see if something comes from the explosion, you know. I don't think something new would come out of it. My phone fell by accident, and all I got out of it is a bunch of cracks on the, on the screen. <laughs> so nothing was created from it. So, but some people believe this, because some scientists wrote in a book, people think it's true. So anyway, this is something that shows people that not only is Hashem the creator of everything, and the precision is something that's not even human, but on top of that is that he's here every single second. Every millisecond that you, have, you function is actually a miracle. So now we talked about it actually about a week or two weeks ago. We talked about how the uh, DNA has Hashem's name in it. Remember when we talked about the, uh, this, uh, every, uh, um, uh, every tenth, five, six, five uh, acid, there's the uh, separation and the bridge of sulfur in the, uh, in, in the DNA. So now each DNA, you know, each one of these microcells that we have in our body, there's countless ones in all of our body. Now each one of these things, just to give you the understanding of how significant it is, the amount of information that's on each cell, if you started writing it, just wrote the information that's on each cell, it would be over 3 million pages full of information. Just one tiny cell. I'm not talking about your body. I'm not talking about your arm or your finger or, or, or even, or even a, 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 a small piece of saliva. No, I'm talking about a cell. A cell is something that's too small for the eye to see. You need a very, very heavy-duty microscope to look at just one single cell. So that one single cell has enough information that if you were to, going to write it in the most neat fashion in the world, in small, small uh, letters, it would still fill well over 3 million pages. Just one single cell. Okay, so now, 
We have a lot of information here. And this is for, this is the part of the, uh, of your cell. You have the DNA molecules, you have the protein support molecules. Now, what scientists figured out is that these proteins are, uh, they say it's linear strings of amino acids. Now, each one of these proteins has to fold a certain way in order for it to function. So I can't really give you a, a great example, obviously, but so obviously like this. Okay, so in order for this to be, let's say this piece of paper over here, in order for it to, let's say, be a, become an envelope. Right? Now, if I fold it like this, it's not usually, it's not going to be a very good envelope because you have holes, right? If I fold it like this and it's perfectly like this, there's a very, very good chance of it being a very good envelope. Okay, I have to fold a couple of more things, but in, in reality, it has to be linear. It has to be straight. Similar concept with your cells. Each one of the cells has countless proteins in it, and each one of these proteins has to fold in a certain way. Okay? Now, the chances, they did a calculation, trying to figure out what, you know, what is the chance of this thing folding this way each time? And more importantly, what happens when one protein... Now, each cell has millions upon millions to the hundredth power of proteins. It's not, it's not like, uh, like I told you, it's three million pages worth of information, so it's a lot. Now, if you took one little fold, you have millions of them, and one fold, ripped. That person has a very, very, very bad disease that's not going away. Wow. Lifelong disease, most likely even death. Just one fold. It ripped. That's it. So I did a calculation. What is the chances of every one of these cells, just a single cell, folding the right way? And they said that in order for us to figure out what is the mathematical equation of a single cell? We have to operate a supercomputer, which is huge computers that nonstop work, 24 hours a day, for 10 years to the 127th power, which is eternity in essence. There's no, there's no such year. 10 to the 127th power years, there's no such year and, and there's no number even. Uh, that we could, uh, you know, even relate to. Beyond our comprehension. Right. So this is, in essence, it's impossible to just calculate, for just cal to just calculate the likelihood of a s one tiny little protein inside a cell folding the right way. Hmm. Why isn't it folding the wrong way? And to have all of them do that? And on top of that, to have them all over your finger, all over your hand, all over your arm, all over your chest, all over your legs, all over your head. It's, it's, there is no such thing as a calculation for something like that that's human. And that's just for a cell. So when you think about this, can this really come from an accident? Can this come really from a coincidence? I coincidentally dropped my phone and it became a world? And that's just one cell. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of how far we are from what's Hashem's significance. It's not something that's, that, that we, could really, uh, um, we could really comprehend. Actually, the Gemara says, I think it's Masechet Shabbat, I actually think it's also from that uh, uh, paper that I read, um, that if you took all of the trees in the world and, and turned them all into, into pencils and the entire ocean was your, in essence, your ink, you still wouldn't be able to write anywhere near 1% of the description of what Hashem really is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when you think about these little microcells that we don't even think of, it makes us realize that there's so much of our body that we don't appreciate, that we got used to, 
that we just take for granted. So for us to do a little bit of a bracha, after we go to the bathroom in the morning, in the afternoon, even if you go 10 times a day, to do something like that, it takes, what, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Let's say you read slow, it takes a minute and a half. He gave you everything that functioned perfectly, and he gave you every one of these cells working, functioning perfectly, and you can't do a bachah a minute and a half? I don't know, it's a little bit of a problem, in my opinion. Because when I ask him for help, and I can't even do this mini bracha for a minute, I don't know, to me I would feel embarrassed. I can't give you a minute and a half, but you're, make, you're making every one of these proteins in my body fold the right way so I could function and not have sickle cell disease or, 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 or some type of autism or some type of major disease that we don't even know exists. It doesn't make sense. So again, these things, it's, we take it for granted and it's something that we really need to wake up and realize that this is something very small we could take on ourselves to make it a permanent thing. It takes a little time to get used to, but it's something to do. Now, the second part of the, uh, of the covenant that we have, the second bleed that we have is tefillin. Now, tefillin is pretty much your daily covenant with Hashem. Six days a week, you have to do tefillin, but seven days a week, you have to have, your covenant has to be active with Hashem. Seven days a week. You have three covenants. Two of them have to be active at all times. Meaning, your bleed is seven days a week. And... Tefillin is six days a week, but on Shabbat you're not allowed to do tefillin. So on Shabbat, the only thing that's allowed to replace tefillin, or in essence take its place, is, is, uh, is Shabbat. So tefillin is six days, and Shabbat takes, excuse me, Shabbat takes its place on, on Shabbat. So the fact that you're keeping Shabbat gets you back to keeping two of the bleeds that you have to keep minimum every day. Now, when you're keeping, when you're doing tefillin every day, and uh, whether you're doing it first thing in the morning on time or you're not at that place yet, but you're doing it every day, then pretty much you're saying, Hello Hashem, I realize that we have a deal. This is my end of the deal. Please make me function and operate and do your part of the deal. And that's it. But when we don't do our part of the deal, it's very strange that we come and, com come and complain to him that something didn't work out. So the best thing to do is to start in the morning and say, okay, this is our deal. I do my deal. This is our covenant. This is telling me that today Hashem is going to be with me all day. Why? Because I started off my day with an, the agreement. First thing of the day, when you wake up in the morning, first thing you see your wife, you say hello. First thing you see your kids, you say hello to them. You give them hugs. You give them kisses. You show them your, uh, your love for them, your appreciation for them. Hashem is nothing less than that. So the, the reality of it is that we have to show Hashem, hey, Hashem, I know you're there, even though I can't see you. And this is one of the ways that I can show you that, I, that, that, that that's what it is. But try to, even if you're doing the tefillin and you're at a point right now where the only thing you're doing is just Kriyat Shema and a tefillin. Maybe you're doing Kriyat Shema and Tefillat Shmona Again, the, do it, but do it, even if it takes you two minutes to do it, do it with all of your heart. Even if it's five minutes of your time and you're not doing the whole shachrit prayer that will take you know, 45 minutes to an hour and you're not ready for it yet and you're not prepared for it yet and all that stuff, at least that five minutes that you're giving yourself to connect with Hashem, do it. Don't play with your phone. You know, don't think about work. Don't think about your wife. Don't think about your kid. Don't think about the problems you have or the customer that's annoying you or this, or that, five minutes, connect with Hashem. just connect with Hashem, that's it, everything off, take the phone, shut it off, don't leave it on at all, like not even vibrate, just shut it off, why, because with today's phones, they keep like right now, yeah, looking at my phone, every two minutes, some bright light is flashing it at you, and it distracts you, and you're trying, it's five minutes, <laughs> you know, you do this, you do this, you know, every two minutes you got somebody texting you, hey, what's up, man, did you see the game yesterday? Hey, what's up, man? It's nonsense. It's never really something important. And even if it is, if it's that important, it can wait five minutes. And you automatically look. It's a reflex. Yeah. It's a reflex. That's, that's part of the amazingness of our eyes, actually. Which I don't know if you guys got to it in the Zamir Cohen book yet. But towards the end of the book, uh, there is a, uh, it starts telling a story of this magical city where the city functions in such a perfect way that everything that goes in 
there's a certain there's a certain way that the uh, a certain amount of things that are allowed in, there's a certain amount of things that are allowed out, and any time that they need to clean it up, there's water coming out automatically. There's you know these amazing uh, system where it cleans the city and it always remains clean. It can never have one piece of dirt on it, and so on and so forth. It goes through this whole story, and then you realize towards the end of the story that what they're describing is actually how your eye functions. Wow. Uh, so it's definitely worth worth a read. It'll take you probably five ten minutes to read it, and it's uh, definitely worth it uh, to look at. It. If you guys want, I'm gonna read it now. It's it's really something I actually probably have to it's refresh the myself. It's towards the end of the book. Yeah, it's uh, and it's it's really something. You know, the thing is when you when you think about your eye, um, your eye was made in a way, was created by Hashem in a way, where in order to protect yourself. Your eye has certain sensors that are always on. So if something is coming towards your eye, whether it's a dirt piece of dirt or it's a uh, bug that's flying directly at you or it's anything else, you have the first line of protection is to look at it, to know that it's coming. Even if you're looking this way and you're focused on something else, you find yourself looking at something right away for no reason whatsoever and you realize that something's coming at you. Second line of protection is that you have your eyelids that are closing. Even if you don't want them to, they're closing. And you have all of these different uh, things of uh, protection that you don't even realize how perfect yeah. no, no. your body it's, is. It's un- I thought about it this, even this week. It's unbelievable. It's happened to me over and over again. With the eye? With the eye. I could... Um, if I take a hammer and I swing at something, let's say I swing at a piece of tile, it's glass. It shatters. Talking about a microscopic piece. I feel it, it hit in my eye. And I'm amazed at the fact how my eye could even see that coming and it, it closed my lid. Unbelievable. Yeah. And it's not coincidence that it hit up here and that, okay, my, you know, my lid is always halfway closed. Yeah. It hits in areas like here. And if my lid doesn't close, your eye, you have, it's going to hurt your eye. Definitely. My, uh, it's like uh, it's unreal. Yeah, if you can't imagine touched, something. Like that. It's un- it's not human. Yeah, it's beyond comprehension. Like we're talking about. It's if really, to just to create, really just just to give you guys, no, yeah, to give you guys an understanding of, of the, uh, the thing that. is also the I shown. I don't know how you say this. It's like you, like you say, if it's just touch it, it's you know in this in the spot here, in the black in the middle, it's like really really fast make damage. It's really yeah. really sensitive. Wow. It's like a, a uh, balloon. It's not. It's not. It's, it's water. It's not. It's not like a. Uh, it's not like your fingers. It's not meat. It's a balloon. Uh, I actually combined two stories. One of them is the city of the future, and the other one is called the super camera. But again, both of them you guys should read in this uh, in this book. Point is that with with your eye, if you actually took all of the supercomputers and all of the regular computers and all of the most amazing technology advancements the world has. They cannot compare to just one single eye and the technology of just one human eye. That's how sophisticated your eye is. So, the fact that we have these things and we got used to them is amazing. It's great. It shows how perfect Hashem's creation is. It shows how perfect the Creator is. So, when we really think about it and it says, okay, listen, to remind myself that I have this deal with this creator and say thank you for five minutes without having my phone ring so I don't have to look at it, it's not really such a big deal. So again, whether you're doing Shachrit completely yet or you're doing just a prayer for five minutes and you're doing just Kriyat Shema with the Tefillin, again, we're not judges here. We're not, uh, we're not here to tell everybody that we're doing everything wrong. We have to do as much as possible. So whatever you're doing, do it a hundred percent. Even if it's five minutes, give him the five minutes, and that's gonna make the next level much easier to do and much more enjoyable. Also, when you connect with the Shem, for, if you could really okay. connect with the Shem for five minutes, you'll wait twenty-four hours just to wait for the next five minutes. That's how great it is. Connecting with the Shem for five minutes—it's something that I can't teach or or, or 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 explain to you guys because it's not something that anyone can really explain. Connecting with Hashem for five minutes, it's, uh, it, it, can make, it can make a lifelong of suffering worth it, just for five minutes, connecting with Hashem. So, again, you have the opportunity to do it every day. 
The uh, second thing is about the um, about tefillin and how and how important it is is tefillin gives us the ability to change our spiritual state, meaning that obviously all prayers that we do and some of them that we've gotten used to and we just go through the motions. It's something that um, even people that have been religious their whole life, or actually maybe even especially people that are religious their whole life, if you don't connect to the prayer and you don't pay attention, you're playing with your phone and you're talking to people and doing all of these things that are not relevant to what you're supposed to be doing, it's very easy to lose track and not com and completely be disconnected to what, to what you're actually doing. And, you know, because you're thinking about something else. You're a prayer and you're doing Tfilach Manaisa, but in reality you're thinking about What's this guy? Oh, what's he doing? Maybe he's, the, you know, you're thinking about something completely different. So, now, prayer and, 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 and the Torah in general is something that's supposed to elevate our spiritual being. Now, what does that mean? We have two parts. We have the, you know, the, the, the physical, we have the spiritual. Physical is your body, spiritual is your soul, and, and other things like your aura, things that are around your soul, around your body. So, those scientists... Um, that uh, try to prove this scientifically because people have said throughout the years that they, f they feel or they see other people's auras. Auras are something that's in essence like a something that goes around your body and it's in different colors. Now your aura is going to tell somebody, if somebody could see an aura, it could tell somebody a lot of information about that person. Number one, if they're in a good mood or, or a bad mood, if they are healthy or un unhealthy, uh, and sometimes even to the point of saying if somebody is a uh, good person or a bad person. Um, so your aura is very much real, even though a lot of people that say they could see it are complete you know, nonsense. It is very real. It's actually in the Torah, uh, talking about the aura. Now, when you are praying and you're connecting to Hashem, you're elevating your standard, meaning that you have a certain standard of, uh, of, of where you are at all times. You know, sometimes you're better than others, sometimes you're in better mood than others, sometimes you feel spiritually higher than others, but overall you have a basic standard, which is represented by a certain color. And then sometimes you're higher or lower than it. So, for example, if somebody has a disease or somebody has depression or something like that, they're going to be lower than what they normally are. And if somebody is praying and connecting to Hashem, they're going to be higher and represented by a different color. So scientists tried to prove this. And uh, for many years, they just uh, they couldn't do it. They actually even mocked people. Uh, they were mocked by people to, for even trying to prove something spiritual. Uh, until one day, these, uh, these couple uh, called uh, Simeon and Valentina Kirlian, uh, uh, they were photographers, and uh, 1939, they took a uh, took a picture, and they realized that there's certain weird colors around certain things, um, and they realized that if you put a uh, high frequency uh, high frequency electric current into the technology of the camera, it actually shows that creatures or that human or animal, whatever it is, that aura around it. It shows the colors. And they developed it more. They came out with something called a Kirlian camera, uh, which scientists started looking into and uh, seeing pretty much people's auras. Now, over time, other people got involved in it. There was more sophisticated cameras in it, and, and now they've connected it to computers where you could pretty much have the camera connected to a computer, take the picture, and the uh, picture shows on the monitor the, uh, the person and the aura around it, different colors, uh, you know, and, uh, that are represented. White is the best color, uh, which is in essence perfect. Uh, purple is near perfect, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, there's other colors there. So now, for a while, people were trying to see, okay, this one, you know, some people have better than others, but there's generally a standard amongst most people. Sometimes there's things that are outside of the standard. So during one of Rabbi Zamir Cohen's uh, lectures, there was a, uh, a scientist by the name of Dr. Alec Navit that was a skeptic, didn't believe it. And he said, you know what, I'm a scientist, let me try this out, let me try this, you know, because he was talking about the, uh, the, the, 
the human aura. He was talking about, you know, how, uh, how these things, and you can see, it's a natural thing. The phone buzzes and you have to pick it up. Um, so, he, um, the, you know, Rabbi is, is talking about different things, about elevating your soul, elevating your spirit, and how, he was talking specifically about tefillin. He's talking about how necessary tefillin is to get yourself to even be at standard. Even to just remain at standard, you need some type of spiritual help. Because we're constantly up and down. And when things are good, sometimes we're doing good. When things are bad, we're definitely not doing good. It's, it's, we're constantly bouncing up and down. You know, sometimes we wake up in the morning, we're depressed for no reason. We don't even know why. Sometimes we're happy for no reason. So we're constantly up and down. So to even get yourself to have a base, you have to have a connection with Hashem. Our direct connection with Hashem is His mitzvot. What are his basics of things? Well, we talked about, again, Shabbat, Tefillin, and Brit. So, Rabbi Zemir was talking about having this, uh, you know, having this connection, having this Tefillin. So this doctor said, you know what, I'm going to try this out and see what happens. So he invited 11 of his friends that were scientists, and all of them were secular. All of them were Chilonim. Some of them were complete atheists. So, people that completely had no connection whatsoever... They weren't doing anything. So they had no biased opinion. If anything, they had a biased opinion against it to prove it wrong. So he took a picture of each person. Fine. <clears throat> then he said, okay, you know what? Let's put this tefillin on each person. And every single person, no exception to the case, had a completely different aura when they had the tefillin on than when they didn't. To such an extent that when they had the tefillin on, a kosher tefillin on, the level of the aura was reaching near perfect. Something that is almost humanly not possible without having something, you know, out of the, you know, that's extraordinary happen. And even more so, they tried to say, okay, wait a minute, how could this be? How could this piece of leather that's on his head and on his arm with... A uh, you know animal hide that you write you put this ink on. How could it possibly change somebody's aura? It doesn't make any sense. So they tried messing with it, and one time what they did is they took out the uh, you know the there's four verses, there's four compartments in the in the one on the head, and uh, they took it out. They took out the uh, the the cluff. They took out the uh, the verses out of it, and it seemed okay. Maybe it's just the leather. Maybe the leather has some type of uh, magnetic power that's causing it. It's leather. It takes about a year to create a, a, a nice kosher tefillin. It's not easy work. And they took it out, and immediately the aura came, went back to as if it never, as if they were wearing nothing. How did they gauge it? There's colors. Oh, they did like. A, so there's colors. Actually, mood, this is also one of the things in this like book. Mood, mood has kind of yeah. So it's, it's colors, and they show how. This, uh, this works, where it's a, uh, the color that the person had when they were, uh, when they were wearing the kosher tefillin was something that, let's say if there's uh, seven colors, you know, the, let's say level one is the worst, somebody that's in bad shape, level two is better, level seven is the highest, but, you know, the standard is, let's say, to be at level three or four, when someone was wearing tefillin was at six or seven. They were near perfect. When they took out the uh, the verse yeah. out of there, they went back to being standard as if they weren't wearing tefillin. When they didn't wear tefillin, they were standard as if they were. As soon as they took out the cloth. Right. Oh. And that's the uh, that's one of the things that made a lot of people wake up, especially those guys that were involved in this uh, uh, in this project. Because again, like I told you, some of the people involved not only didn't do what Hashem wanted, but some of them didn't even believe he existed. So, it's, uh, it's, it's, this, is, this is things that science can't explain without uh, adding God to the picture. So here you go, this is, this is the, uh, like a picture of somebody's aura. So you have different colors. Wow. And this is the people wearing tefillin, before tefillin, after tefillin. And you see how much more blue it has, whereas here it has yellow. This one got to near perfect. It got purple. 
here is yellow is a standard pretty much. So these guys are all pretty much mostly yellow. This guy's a little bit better, but all of them get to purple or even shades of white after they wear the tefillin. This actually is something very special where it's a woman covering her hair, which is something we're going to talk about in one of the lectures uh, later on, the significance and the importance of a woman covering her hair. And this is just a woman covering her hair. So, I mean, you think about, okay, a woman is not covering her hair with electric magne uh, magnetic field on her head. She's not covering her hair with uh, some type of, uh, you know, metal. She's not covering her hair with anything that's uh, inhumane. She's, it's, you know, either a uh, scarf of some kind or a hat. It's cotton. It's something very simple. Here, a woman is not covering her hair. Here, she's covering her hair. And you see that the aura of the person, again, for the woman, is, again, getting closer and closer to perfect. And it's, it's amazing that science is helping prove something what the Torah has been saying for, for many, many years. Um, yeah. Oh. So, yeah, look at this part right there. This is it. You went to the book. Look at that. Uh, page 264. So that's something that I think is uh, pretty amazing, covering the hair and, and okay, so now, so tefillin again, this is a reminder for ourselves really, it's not really a reminder for Hashem because Hashem doesn't forget, Hashem doesn't change his opinion, Hashem doesn't do anything that's what humans do, okay, and, and there's several verses in the Torah that uh, were reminded of these things, where if somebody ever thought, you know, maybe Hashem made a mistake, but maybe, maybe, maybe it's something that they, uh, maybe Hashem forgot. So actually in the book of Job, did I, guess, did I tell you guys about the book of Job, about the, uh, the story that when uh, Job thought that Hashem made a mistake? Did I tell you guys about that? Job. No? Oh yeah. All right, well if you don't remember it, then I'll tell you again. Yosef? No, Job. Job's a yo uh, Yov. Yov. So Job, Job was not Jewish, but he was a prophet. And Job was very, very rich, had kids, had wife, uh, had a, you know, and was a righteous person. So the whole story of Job is, is long, but the point is that uh, one day the uh, Satan came to Hashem and said, ah, you know, the only reason, well, first, actually, Hashem said to Satan, look at this righteous son that I have, Job, that uh, he's doing everything I want, he's, you know, even though he was, there wasn't Judaism at the time, this is uh, how we know he wasn't Jewish, this is before the Torah, um, but he's, you know, he was keeping the mitzvot, he was doing everything he needs to do, um, and was honoring Hashem all day, so... Hashem is telling the Satan, hey, listen, you know, look how righteous my son is. Look at, uh... so Satan says, yeah, of course, he's righteous. You give him everything that he wants. Why wouldn't he be? He's rich, he's got kids, he's got a wife. Why wouldn't he be righteous? But if you take away these things from him, he's going to change. He's going to change. So Hashem said, okay, let's test it. Let's see, let's see if you're, uh, let's see if what you're saying is right. You're allowed to do anything to uh, to him except kill him. You're not allowed to kill him. And this was multiple tests. The first test was that he uh, lost his money. All of a sudden, he had people from the, you know, the people, the, his workers come back to him. He had one worker come back to him, say, okay, listen, I, uh, all the sheep that we had, all of a sudden there was a, uh, a gang of wolves that came and killed all of our sheep. Shortly after, another one of his workers said the same thing about the chickens. Shortly after, another one came from pretty much all of his money, all, all of his wealth. All his inventory was lost. His inventory done. Then they started talking about, okay, the, the building, the, uh, the house over here got destroyed. And then shortly after, this is all happening right away. And shortly after, and, 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 uh, your sons were celebrating and having, uh, they all got together. And they were celebrating. And one of the houses that got destroyed, they were under it and they all died. Wow. So all of your kids are dead. And I'm here as the only survivor 
to tell you the story. A big wind came and, you know, made the, destroyed the house and they all died. So his sons died, his money's gone, and he's still praying to Hashem. So then shortly later, Satan says, okay, so he hasn't failed, but, but if you take away more from him, surely he will go against you, Hashem. So Hashem said, okay, you could do everything but kill him. So then he starts taking away his health. And it gives him different diseases. He starts, uh, starts getting these different uh, abscesses all over his body. He gets to a point where it's a uh, completely cannot function. Uh, he, shortly later, he loses his house. His, his, you know, so pretty much his whole world goes upside down. I mean, there's a lot of details to the story, but and uh, I don't want to uh, not give you guys the story properly, but the point is that it's, everything that he had is gone. So then, after everything is gone, his health is gone, his wife is complaining, his wife is telling him, you know, what's, what are you doing, you know, why are you still honoring this God still that's, that's doing all of this to you? Um, and actually, in that, uh, the way he answers her, the verse that uh, is written of how he answers her gives us a, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, repetition of what, something that was written in the parasha, I think last week or the week before, what Abraham's father said. Uh, and that's why people say that he's actually, Job was Abraham's father's Gilgul. Gilgul is one, reincarnation. They said the same thing. So anyway, um, then he has his uh, friends come by from far away to, uh, you know, to, to help him. Instead of helping him, they start judging him. They say, well, surely this happened to you because you weren't as righteous as we thought you were. And instead of helping him, they start judging him and criticizing him. Friends like that, who needs enemies? But what ends up happening at some point, right before Hashem finally answers him, is that he says, Hashem, maybe Hashem thinks that instead of Eyov, which is his name, I am Oyev. Oyev is enemy. Now if you, the words, the, the word Eyov, which is his name, Job, in Hebrew, if you turn around one of the letters, it becomes the word Oyev, which is enemy. Oyev. So, so, so he says that, uh, so it's the same letters, just, just moving one of the letters to the other you. space. So he's saying maybe Hashem made a mistake and instead of remembering that I'm his loyal son, Eyov, that's loyal to him, that's praised to him, that honors him, that has always been for him, maybe he thinks that I'm his enemy. And that's why he's doing all this to me. And that's when Hashem answered him. And Hashem says, He's created the whole world with all of the creations that are around the world. But even the minor details he pays attention to. And he says, you have hair. You have a lot of hair on your head. Each one of your hairs has, needs nutrients in order to survive. E and each one of your hairs is in essence its own world. For example, your sweat is the food that, the hair, that your hair has. Like if you don't sweat, you're, you're, it's, it's, you're very likely to lose your hair. And actually, the, uh, I think it's in the Gemara or somewhere else, they said that if every, every hair has its own hole, and if two hairs ever come out of the same hole, the person becomes blind. So that's how precise the creation is. That's how precise your, your, your head and your body is. Just two hairs out of the same hole makes the person blind. Mm -hmm. So he says, I know the name of every one of your hairs. Hashem is telling them, I know the name. There's a name for every one of your hairs has a name. I know the name for every one of your hairs. And you think that I made a mistake and I think you're my enemy instead of Ayob? I made a mistake with your name? So it reminds me of another story that um, Rabbi Mizrahi said in one of his Hebrew lectures. I mean, he's, he's fantastic, really. I mention him a lot because I really, really want you guys to start listening to him because he tells the truth and how it's supposed to be. And, he, was uh, was, he was the one that was just here. 
No. Recently. No, no, no. He's the one we're trying to bring here, but he hasn't been here recently. Oh, okay. Um, he's the one that gave you the discs, all those discs that I gave right, you. Right, That's Mizrahi. So that's Mizrahi. <clears throat> uh, the movie that I keep telling you guys to watch, that's, that's Mizrahi. Mizrahi. That's Mizrahi. <laughs> so, um, and again, I, I, there's plenty of really good rabbis. Uh, obviously, I, 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 I keep pushing uh, Rabbi Mizrahi and, and my cousin, Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon, um, even beyond other rabbis that I watch uh, and follow because it's... You watch a lot of different people speak in your life, whether it's business or Torah or different things, you start becoming a little bit of a better judge of who gets to the point faster, better, and, and, and in general covers more. And I think they do the best job, in my opinion, uh, to meet the immediate needs of most, pe most people. Once somebody you know, has other needs, they have some work, but other people can also cover some of the other work. But I think that especially for the Baal Tshuva, for someone that's really trying to get closer to Hashem, trying to serve their purpose in this world, I think that the, um, you know, they, they can help somebody do that uh, in, in, in a phenomenal way. My, my cousin's way, uh, Ephraim Kachlon, he's, um, he's a huge genius and uh, uh, really somebody that dedicated his entire life and continues to dedicate his entire life purely studying Torah, nothing else, no work, no nothing else. He's completely studying Torah. And the amount of knowledge that that's, uh, he has is um, really ex just something that is hard to even explain. And it's not just knowledge about stories about the Torah. I'm talking about knowledge about life, business, uh, the, the universe, any, anything you really want. Someone that knows Torah can pretty much have access to all knowledge, everything. Whether it's science or it's uh, commerce or anything else. And that's what you see, like rabbis, really special rabbis like uh, Rabbi Zamir Cohen write these books uh, that cover so much stuff about science. Mm -hmm. And you just see the, uh, you see the guy, you know, normal rabbi. You know, he's got the beard, he's got the hat, he's got the basic uniform. And this guy has this immense amount of knowledge that's out of this world, and you're like, wait a minute, how do you learn this stuff from the story about Moses? How do you learn this stuff about the story, of, you know, how, how do you know this stuff? And that's the beauty of the Torah. The Torah is endless. So, these a lot of these rabbis are really special, and they, you know, a lot of them, you know, really uh, get you some information. With my cousin, I, I mention it because he has a very unique way of saying some of his stories, and he's also very funny to, you know, uh, when it's appropriate. Um, and his way is... You know the uh, the the um, the chenoam. So in his, his way is to do it in a gentle way, where he's teaching you, he's giving you information, while at the same time, you know, helping you get closer to Hashem by telling you why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and he does it in a you know, it's a uh, and not as, he tells you what's wrong and what's right. He's not only gonna sugarcoat everything and, and like some people do which I think is a mistake uh, where they only tell you the good part of the Torah where all the good things that you're going to get if uh, what's called that Hashem said but they don't tell you what happens if you don't do right because that's really more than half of the Torah is what Hashem is telling us what happens if we don't do what he says and to eliminate that part of the Torah is not only misleading people but it's pretty much guaranteeing that person that's doing it, a very, very bad future. But also those people, guaranteeing that they're going to have a much, much more difficult path uh, and journey to get to Hashem, to get to the right direction. Because that's what happened with these reform movements and conservative movements where originally someone had this idea where they thought that they have a better way than what Hashem said for people to connect to Him. And what ended up happening is that they completely went off and it's become its own religion. Reform and conservative is not even real, real Judaism. They can call themselves Reform Judaism. They can call themselves uh, Conservative Judaism. They can call themselves Superman. doesn't mean that they are. I call myself Superman. doesn't mean that I'm going to have a cape tomorrow and start flying everywhere. So just because something calls itself Judaism does not mean it's Judaism. Judaism, if you want to know true Judaism, true Judaism is what the Torah says. And the only ones that are you know, doing what the Torah says are Orthodox Judaism. So... Again, it's not uh, the, uh, the ones that are 
you know, completely violating what's in the Torah, and it's not necessarily people that are doing things that, you know, are forcing people to do things that are above what the Torah says, which is, you know, strange uniforms and, and, and strange habits that is more of a machmil uh, thing, where it's where they're doing above and beyond. It's not necessary. It's not bad, it's just not necessary. Um, so, when it comes down to to Judaism, we have to make sure that we do what the Torah says, know why it's saying it, know why we're doing it, and, and go that way. So my cousin's direction and the way he does things is that he teaches you what you need to know, he tells you what's wrong, what's right, in a gentle way. Rabbi Mizrahi is a little bit more in your face where he's going to tell you what 99% of rabbis are not willing to tell you, either because they're scared or because, you know, to, to scare people or, or to... Uh, uh, tell people things that, uh, you know, make them uncomfortable. In my opinion, it's the only way to do it. In my opinion, the way he does it, it's the only way to do it. And the reason why I say that is because the nice way where people say stories and they, uh, you know, and, and they tell you jokes and everybody laughs and everybody's friendly and the men and women are sitting together and it becomes this little party and there's food everywhere and all that stuff, that stuff doesn't really work. You know, the fact that people tell you, hey, listen, just be, you know, your mom is Jewish, you're Jewish, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, and don't worry, uh, you know, things are going to work out for you, uh, even if you don't keep anything, just light some candle on Shabbat, you'll be fine. That's nonsense. And I know this, not from just hearing him, but I know this from personal experience. I'm not going to mention name and, and names right now. But if you figure out who the names are, please don't say them because I don't want anyone that's watching this to, uh, to know because I don't want to badmouth anybody publicly. But this is good for everybody to know the difference between real and fake. So now, I had, there's obviously a lot of different Jewish organizations. And when I had my uh, office in New York, we had... Um, <laughs> By the way, I just said, don't mention, you just came in. Don't mention, if you figure out who the names are, don't, don't say the name out loud, because I don't want anybody like to know who the names are. So, okay. So anyway, um, when I had my office, I, uh, uh, there, and I, you know, we had a lot of people, and we had people, you know, this was in New York, so you have a lot of religious people come to my office all the time. Uh, and, you know, we'd give them tzedakah, and if they had something to say, we'd listen to them. Um, and we had some Jewish guys at the office, sometimes they would do tefillin, uh, they would remind them to do tefillin. Sometimes they would tell them a little story about Shabbat, you know, different different things. And uh, whoever wanted to donate, they would donate. Whoever wanted to listen, would listen. But for, with my office, the way it was is that it always was an open door policy. If you are in the neighborhood and you want to come and tell us about Torah, you know, you can come do it, and we're more more than happy to keep it. Even though there was, you know, religion wasn't part of our business. Uh, you know, I wasn't religious at the time. And neither was um, pretty much 99% of the office, with the exception of one guy. Um, so people would come from time to time, and they knew that none of us kept Shabbat. They knew that none of us kept anything, uh, for that matter. Some worse than others. And the attitude was the nice way, what people call the nice way, where they would tell us stories or a joke or just remind us to do maybe a uh, tefillin here and there. Um, and that's it. But it was like, pretty much if you want to do, the, the way that it worked is that if you want to do something, you're going to do it. I'm not going to tell you you need to do it, but you'll do it. And I can tell you for sure, for basic, based on just simple math, we had the office for more than 10 years, but let's just count, let's just calculate it off of 10 years. We had people come to my office at the minimum twice a week, most likely three times a week. But even if we do it once a week, once a week, 52 weeks a year, that's 52 times, 10 years, so that's 520 times. 520 times, 20 times, some type of rabbi came to my office and had an opportunity to help somebody in the office, we had oh, 30, 40, 50 people in the office, whatever it was, uh, many of which were Jewish. Somebody to do tshuva, somebody to do anything, and I could tell you that out of 520 times, which is more likely like 1,500 times, 
Now, one person ever kept Shabbat because of any of this. One time, 500 times you had an opportunity. 500 times you had an opportunity, and not one Shabbat was kept. Not one meal was kosher because of it. The only thing we did occasionally was being reminded that we're to do tefillin, which, again, great, but 500 times it's all you achieved? That's why I know for sure that the nice way doesn't work. Now, of course, you have to be nice when you communicate with people. And like when I tell you guys, listen, this is the punishment for this, this is the punishment for that. I'm not judging you, Chas V'chalil. Because again, keep in mind, I was in your shoes, if not worse, at some point in my life. Whether it's you guys here or anyone that's watching it here. I was much, much worse than most people. And that's why I always say that if I could do tshuva, anybody could do tshuva. I was as far as you can be. But the key here is that, for me, in my opinion, is that if I knew the information, I might have made a different choice. Now, there's a difference between knowing something is wrong and knowing the significance of how wrong it is. Now, everyone knows, everyone that's Jewish, unless they were born in some, you know, I don't know, uh, jungle, Everyone knows that you're supposed to keep Shabbat and violating Shabbat is not good. Everyone generally knows that. Whether they believe or don't believe is a different story. But everyone knows you're not supposed to as a Jewish person. Everyone knows that you're supposed to do some basic things in Judaism. And that's why they show up to synagogue once a year on Yom Kippur or something, right? <laughs> two, hours before, <laughs> two hours before the holiday is over, they show up to synagogue. Because they, there's a part of them that connects them to it to some extent. It's, hundreds of it's cars, a conscience. Hundreds of cars on the grass of my third circle. <laughs> it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's not. It's not just here. It's everywhere. I mean, where it's you know, in New York, we had people that you know, you have the synagogue full, you know, half full the the during the uh, day of Yom Kippur, two hours before Yom Kippur. There's people around the building of the of the of the synagogue that just showed up. That's just the way it is. It's it's uh, so there's a connection. When I just talk bad about people, the point is there's a connection. Everyone knows there's something there. They believe it. In knowing and knowing. The details are completely two different worlds. Knowing that you're supposed to keep Shabbat is one thing. Knowing that if you don't keep Shabbat, you are considered less than a Gentile, less than a non-Jew. Not the same. You're not considered the same. Because a, gen- a non-Jew that is fulfilling his purpose, which is seven laws that Hashem gave them, the seven laws of Noah. Okay, they have seven responsibilities. Uh, to, uh, to have a court... To not eat living animals, not steal, not One kill. Of them Shabbat, no? no, no, they don't have Shabbat. Shabbat is only for Jews. Uh, no, there is something else. Uh, uh, not kill, not steal. Uh, to have a uh, court, to uh, uh, not eat uh, an animal while it's still alive. Um, uh, was it intermarriage? Yeah, there's a few, a few other things. I'll, I forgot them right now, but it's uh, this. Two or three other ones. The seven. And anyway, the seven laws of Noah. So the point is that the, uh, if, a, if a non-Jew is doing that, and a Jewish person is not keeping Shabbat, that non-Jew is not only better, but he's going to heaven. And the Jew, not so much. So it's not a small difference. It's a huge difference. And that's the point of what I'm trying to tell you.